Chapter 10 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 6, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 10. Fredericksburg. It was on a raw and gusty November day that General Buckingham arrived at Burnside's headquarters at the little village of Orleans, and delivered him the orders to take command of the Army of the Potomac. He was greatly surprised, he himself says shocked, at the news. He told General Buckingham that it was a matter which required very serious thought, that it had been offered to him twice before, and that he did not feel he could take it. He called two of his staff officers into consultation, and for more than an hour resisted their importunities that he should accept it. He told them, what in light of experience we know was true, that he was not competent to command such a large army. He had said as much to the President, and to the Secretary of War, when they on a former occasion had intimated to him that such a promotion was thought of. In the dissatisfaction prevailing in high quarters in Washington against McClellan, the name Burnside had been more than once mentioned, in the councils of the government as his successor, a suggestion which Burnside had always discountenanced. He was an intimate and devoted friend of McClellan, and thought him better fitted than anyone else in the Army of the Potomac to command it. But now, forced to decide in one short hour of twilight, finding himself with no counsel but that of General Buckingham, who bore the orders and urged the wishes of the government, and of his staff, who were naturally rejoiced at his promotion, he was unable to persist in his refusal. He and General Buckingham started at once for McClellan's headquarters at Rectortown, and there, as a matter of course, the deposed general could say nothing more than that it was the duty of General Burnside to obey his orders, and that he congratulated him upon his good fortune. It would be hard to say to which of these commanders the messages of General Buckingham was of the more evil omen. The removal of McClellan was a blow to him, the bitterness of which was to last through his life. But there was reserved for General Burnside, as a consequence of his new honors, a day of disaster and gloom, which, to a man of his sensitive and kindly nature, must have been bitterer still. It can be safely said that from the hour when, in that blinding of snowstorm, he accepted the command of the Army of the Potomac, to the hour when he laid it down in discouragement and despair, he did not see a single happy day. Yet even now it is difficult to say what better choice at that moment the government could have made. He was next in rank to the commanding general. Of McClellan's subordinates in the Army of the Potomac there were none who had as yet shown capacity for important, independent command, while Burnside had at least the prestige of a great success in North Carolina. He was highly esteemed in Army circles, and had made, like McClellan, a prosperous career for himself in civil life. He had hosts of friends, was manly, honorable, and chivalrous in character. He was as acceptable to the adherents of McClellan as any one could have been, and was as little objectionable to McClellan himself as was possible for his successor to be. They were up to that time close friends. The unkind criticisms of Burnside's conduct at Antietam, which McClellan afterwards embodied in his report, were reflections which had arisen long after the fight prompted by the instinct of self-preservation. To the ardent spirits in Congress, and in the press, who were urging a more vigorous prosecution of the war, Burnside was highly acceptable, and his appointment was greeted with great enthusiasm. Somewhat to Mr. Lincoln's chagrin, the first act of the new general was to object to the plan of campaign which had been furnished to McClellan from Washington. Instead of this, he proposed to transfer his army to Fredericksburg, and from that point to move upon Richmond. General Halleck went down to visit him, and a thorough discussion of the matter took place between them. Neither seemed inclined to yield his preferences, and Halleck went back to Washington to lay the matter before the President. He, having given his confidence, was not, at this early day, inclined to limit or withdraw it. He therefore assented to Burnside's plan on condition that he move rapidly, and it was put immediately in the way of execution. But every step in this unhappy campaign went wrong from the very beginning. General Halleck and General Burnside seemed never fully to understand each other. 
General Halleck says in his report that Burnside was not expected to move to Falmouth, but to cross his army by the fords of the upper Rappahannock and then move down and seize the heights south of Fredericksburg. He was slow in beginning the movement, and when he arrived on the north bank of the river he found that the pontoons, by which he had expected to cross, had not arrived, but that Lee and his army had. Sumner had got there a few days in advance, and had asked permission of Burnside to cross and take the heights which afterwards proved so deadly to our troops. This permission was refused. Hooker, in turn, had asked leave to cross his corps at one of the upper fords to come in upon the left flank of Lee, but this proposition was also declined. If Burnside had been able to cross the river on the day he arrived at Falmouth, he might still have been in time to occupy the important position opposite him without loss, for it was only that day that Longstreet's corps was put in motion towards Fredericksburg, and it was a week later before Jackson was ordered to join him there. But the pontoons had not arrived, and an acrimonious controversy, covering hundreds of pages of the official records, arose as to the responsibility for this failure. It is a controversy in which, as it seems to us, no candid reader of the records can take sides. Neither General Burnside, nor those staff officers specially charged with the duty, nor General Halleck, nor the engineer officers in whose jurisdiction the business lay, paid sufficient prompt and continuous attention to it. Each naturally endeavors to throw the blame on the others, but there was not a man in connection with the affair who acted with the promptness and energy required. The bridge trains did not arrive until the afternoon of the 25th of November, and it was not until the 10th of December that General Burnside was ready for the perilous enterprise of crossing the Rappahannock. The President visited the Army on the 27th of November, and had a long conversation with Burnside with regard to his campaign. Burnside told Mr. Lincoln that he had all the men he wanted, that he could not handle a greater number to advantage, that he thought he could cross the river and drive the enemy away, though it was somewhat risky. The President returned to his steamer, and on the way to Washington wrote a letter to Halleck detailing the above conversation with Burnside, and going on to say, I wish the case to stand more favorably than this in two respects. First, I wish his crossing of the river to be nearly free from risk, and secondly, I wish the enemy to be prevented from falling back, accumulating strength as he goes into his entrenchments at Richmond. He then proposed a plan of campaign of which the main features were these. Burnside was to remain for the present at Falmouth, to occupy the south bank of the Rappahannock about Port Royal with the strong force, say 25,000 men, an equal force to be placed on the north bank of the Pam Monkey, as high as up as it could be protected by gunboats. When all was ready, Burnside to cross the Rappahannock and the two auxiliary armies to march simultaneously, the force from Port Royal upon Lee's right flank, while that from the Pam Monkey could hold or destroy the roads and bridges in his rear. Such a movement, if successful, would be destructive of Lee's army, while, if it failed, the retreat to the support of the gunboats would always be practicable. This plan was rejected by both Halleck and Burnside on the ground that the force on the Pamunkey could not be raised and put in position without too much waste of time. In the meantime, the enemy had not lost a day. Lee's entire army was now concentrated at Fredericksburg, and for several miles above and below. General Longstreet on the left, holding the heights immediately in the rear of the city, while Jackson's corps was stationed on the crest of the hills below, the two commands covering the entire range of heights from above the city to the Richmond Railroad. Beyond Jackson, Stuart, with his cavalry and the horse artillery, occupied the plain to the river. The Confederates had thrown up formidable earthworks and planted batteries at every advantageous point. The whole line of hills had become one great fortress manned by the veteran soldiers of the Army of Virginia, under the three ablest commanders of the South. At the time that General Burnside resolved to cross, his plan of battle was at best vague and confused. He had at first intended to cross the river some fourteen miles below the city, but at the last moment finding that the enemy had prepared to resist him at that point, he changed his mind and concluded to throw his bridges across to the town of Fredericksburg, and to consult the Confederate position in front. It was a bold determination, but all the credit that is to be given to General Burnside for his unquestioned bravery 
must be taken from that which is to be awarded to his discretion. It was with utter amazement, mingled with satisfaction, that the Confederates, in the safe shelter of their impregnable works, watched the Army of the Potomac moving across the Rappahannock to the attack. General Burnside's army had been divided, at his request, into three grand divisions. Sumner commanded the right, Franklin the left, and Hooker was held in reserve. The duty which Burnside says he expected of Franklin was to attack the right wing of the Confederate army posted upon the hills below the town, and to gain the crest of these hills, which would give him access to the newly made road which led in the rear of all the rebel works. Sumner, after the attack of Franklin had been fully developed, was to move directly out upon two roads which led through the town, and storm the heights behind the city. The troops began crossing at dawn on the 11th of December. The building of the bridges proceeded but slowly at first, on account of the harassing fire of the enemy. But a body of troops sent over in the pontoons themselves charged upon their assailants in the town and quickly cleared the ground. The bridges were then at once completed, and the army passed over without loss. By the night of the 12th the troops were all in position, and Burnside visited the different commands to decide upon his final orders for the next day. He must have been in some confusion and trouble of mind, being even then not unconscious of a want of sympathy and confidence between himself and his leading generals. It is probably due to this fact that his orders to Franklin were so lacking in definiteness that that general passed the night, as he said, in sleepless anxiety, not precisely knowing what was expected of him the next day, and it was not until half-past seven o'clock in the morning of the 13th that General James A. Hardy arrived at Franklin's headquarters with a program for the battle. Even then the vagueness had not disappeared from General Burnside's intentions. Instead of an order to assault the heights in front of him with the entire force at his disposition, General Burnside merely directed Franklin to keep your whole command in position for a rapid movement down the old Richmond Road, and you will send out at once a division, at least, to pass below Smithfield, to seize, if possible, the heights near Captain Hamilton's, taking care to keep it well supported and its line of retreat open. Upon these ambiguous orders, Franklin fought all day, sending in at first Meade's division, and following it up successively with five others, until more than a whole army corps was engaged in a fierce and sanguinary battle. Meade did all that any one could have done. He made a brilliant and resolute charge, penetrating the line of A.P. Hill's division, surprising the line in rear, and putting it to rout, capturing three hundred prisoners and several stands of colors. But the bravest of men cannot long hold his hand in the flames, and Meade, exposed to a galling fire in front and on both flanks, was soon compelled to retire. The reinforcements which Franklin sent him checked the pursuit of the enemy. But although the fight raged on the left all day, the point which Meade reached in the morning was never regained. General Franklin always insisted that General Burnside, the night before, had not favored his proposition to attack on the left in force, and that he understood the movement ordered on the morning of the 13th was to be merely a strong reconnaissance, and that he remained under that impression until a later hour of the day when Burnside sent an aide-de-camp to order an advance on the heights in front of him, of movement which then seemed to him impracticable. Burnside, on the contrary, always contended that Franklin had not done his full duty, and the Committee on the Conduct of War took the same ground in their report. About eleven o'clock General Sumner was ordered to push his troops out through the town and attack the heights in the rear. Although General Burnside had some intimation of the extent of the Confederate works, Yet for lack of proper reconnaissances, neither he nor any of his officers had any conception of their real strength. So that Sumner's corps, as they pushed out under the gray wintry skies over the so-called telegraph and plank roads in high hopes of carrying the enemy's line, were merely going to certain slaughter, unrelieved by any possibility of success. The roads they were following brought them directly to a sharp eminence surrounded by the high ground of an estate known as Mary's. Its eastern boundary was itself a fortification, consisting of a road partly sunken running north and south. On the side of the road towards the town was a stone wall four feet high. On the side towards Mary's, a similar wall supporting the base of the hill. 
both sides of the road had been reinforced and fortified by the confederate engineers and artillerists the whole declivity was one bristling mass of cannon and of muskets served by stout-hearted soldiers waiting silently in the grimmest joy a soldier ever knows that of seeing his enemy approach him and in his power after the lapse of twenty years the mind shrinks and sickens at the task of describing the carnage of that day sumner sent forward the divisions of french and hannock as his storming column they marched some seventeen hundred yards absolutely without shelter under a withering fire when they came within assaulting distance there were not enough of them left to assault hannock's division lost two thousand men and french's twelve hundred some of the men fell within twenty-five paces of the stone wall sturgis's division exhibited the same bravery and shared the same fate general carroll next came up and then griffin pushing their lines to within a few yards of the death-dealing hill and then falling back without result hooker at last was ordered to take what was left of his troops the rest having previously been sent in other directions and attack these impregnable heights there was probably no man in the army whose appetite for fighting was less questionable than hooker's but it is entirely to his credit that when he looked at the position he was ordered to assault he sent an aide de camp to general burnside to advise him not to attack at that place burnside who by this time had reached a dangerous point of excitement reiterated the order to attack then fighting joe hooker put spurs to his horse and rode to headquarters and there for the first and last time in his life begged that his troops might not be ordered to destruction General Burnside still insisted upon his orders, and Hooker, with a final protest, went back to his devoted column. It suited General Burnside afterwards to think that this protesting attitude of Hooker's diminished the vigor of his attack, but there was no foundation for such a belief. No braver or more hopeless assault was ever made. Hooker accompanied in person his soldiers of the Fifth Corps under General Butterfield. The division commanders were Griffin, sykes and humphreys all distinguished themselves equally for bravery and good conduct the final charge of humphreys division was one of the most remarkable incidents of the war he commanded two brigades about forty five hundred strong they were mostly fresh troops who had never been in battle before as they advanced to the front the officers were greatly embarrassed by the number of soldiers whom they found lying on their faces unable to resist the murderous fire a part of Humphrey's division at once followed the example of these troops, and, lying down, began firing at the rebel infantry some two hundred yards in advance. General Humphreys, who had no superior in that army in ability or bravery, seeing that nothing could be done by musketry fire against the rebel position, determined as a last resort to try to charge with the bayonet. By the personal exertions of himself and his staff, he induced his command to cease firing and formed them for a charge. He gave orders to pay no attention to the men lying on the ground, but to run over them, and to stop for nothing till they had crossed bayonets with the enemy. He then ordered the officers to the front. Tyler's brigade, led by Tyler and Humphreys, marched with a cheer over the ground under the heaviest fire of the day. The stone wall, says Humphreys in his report, was a sheet of flame that enveloped the head and flanks of the column. Officers and men were falling rapidly, and the head of the column was at length brought to a stand when close up to the wall. Up to this time not a shot had been fired by the column, but now some firing began. It lasted but a minute, when, in spite of all our efforts, the column turned and began to retire slowly. At the end of this magnificent, though disastrous, charge, only one member of Humphrey's staff was left mounted, and his horse had three wounds. The general had two horses killed under him, yet so effective was the indomitable spirit of Humphrey's upon his men, that the meager remnants of them retired, slowly and in good order, singing and hurrahing. He had lost in a few minutes one thousand nineteen men. As Humphreys led back his undaunted soldiers from the fight, it was growing dark. Hooker concludes his story by the grim remark, Finding I had lost as many men as my orders required me to lose, I suspended the attack. General Burnside passed the greater part of the night among the officers and men of the right wing, 
It was a cheerless promenade, utterly devoid of comfort or encouragement. In the morning, unrefreshed by sleep or any other source of cheer, he had to decide upon his course for the day. Whatever else he may have lacked, he did not lack bravery. Perhaps we might use a stronger word to describe his state of mind on that gloomy morning of the 14th. His first orders breathed the spirit akin to desperation. He directed General Sumner to order the Ninth Army Corps to form in column of attack by regiments. These were his household troops. He had led them to victory before. He considered that they would be faithful to him, though all the world besides abandoned him. He determined to lead them in person against those fatal heights where the whole right wing of the army had been shattered the previous day. But before the hour when the column was to have started, General Sumner came to him. The orders he had received dismayed even that optimistic veteran, who always rejoiced in the turmoil of battle when there was anything like a chance for his side. He said, General, I hope you will desist from this attack. I do not know of any general officer who approves of it, and I think it will prove disastrous to the army. Advice like this, from one so hardy and sanguine as Sumner, naturally affected Burnside. He kept his column of attack formed, but called his division and corps commanders into consultation. They were unanimous against him. He then crossed the river and consulted the officers on the other side, with the same result. He next asked Franklin's opinion, which was the same. He would not at once yield his resolution, and dallied with it all that day and the greater part of the next. But on the evening of the 15th he resolved to withdraw his troops to Falmouth, and in the night, under cover of the darkness and a driving storm, this was successfully accomplished. And on the 16th General Lee, who had been anxiously expecting another attack, telegraphed to Richmond. As far as can be ascertained this stormy morning, the enemy has disappeared in our immediate front and has recrossed the Rappahannock. I presume he is meditating a passage at some other point. It was General Lee's impression that another crossing would immediately be made at some distance below Fredericksburg, and he took his measures accordingly. He wrote to Richmond, Should the enemy cross at Port Royal in force before I can get this army in possession to meet him, I think it more advantageous to retire to the Annas and give battle than on the banks of the Rappahannock. My design was to have done so in the first instance. This greatest of Lee's victories was therefore an accident, flung into his hands by the fortunes of war. Terrible as was this defeat, and directly chargeable as it was to the heirs of the general in command, it is a remarkable proof of the sterling worth of his personal character that it did not materially injure him in the public estimation. His conduct after the fight was in striking contrast to that of his predecessor. Instead of throwing upon the government the blame of his disaster, as McClellan did on every occasion, in his report of the 17th of December, he assumed the entire responsibility. He gave generous praise to his officers and men. For the failure in the attack I am responsible, he said, as the extreme gallantry, courage, and endurance shown by them was never excelled and would have carried the points had it been possible. The fact that I decided to move from Warrenton on to this line rather than against the opinion of the President secretary and yourself general halleck and that you have left the whole management in my hands without giving me orders makes me the more responsible i will add here that the movement was made earlier than you expected and after the president secretary and yourself requested me not to be in haste for the reason that we were supplied much sooner by the different staff departments than was anticipated when i last saw you this manly shouldering of the blame which he felt was his own went far in the mind of a generous people to redeem many errors of judgment. The President sent a kind and sympathetic dispatch to the army, in which he said, Although you were not successful, the attempt was not an error nor the failure other than accident. The courage with which you in an open field maintained the contest against an entrenched foe, and the consummate skill and success with which you crossed and recrossed the river in the face of the enemy, Show that you possess all the qualities of a great army, which will yet give victory to the cause of the country and of popular government. General Burnside received friendly and encouraging letters also from General Halleck and the Secretary of War. But the damage which he had received could not be healed by complimentary letters or general orders. 
that indefinable abstraction, which is called the morale of the army, had suffered a grievous hurt in those days of December. Every officer who had leave to come to Washington whispered a woeful story of disorganization and discouragement in the ears of his political friends. Even the cheery Sumner, when examined by a committee of Congress, while stoutly defending his chief, admitted, There was too much croaking in the army. Henry J. Raymond, who visited the camp at Fredericksburg about this time, records in his diary a sorry impression of the state of gloom and discouragement among the officers and soldiers. The colonel of a Michigan regiment in the course of conversation told him that the despondency of the officers and men was due mainly, in his opinion, to want of confidence in General Burnside. In reply to the question why they lacked confidence in him, the colonel answered, because he had no confidence in himself. That General Burnside had not only spoken of his incompetency, but had gone before the Congressional Committee and sworn to it. It was impossible to stop for a moment by a group of soldiers talking around the campfire, without hearing enough to show that the commanding general had lost the confidence of the rank and file of the army. Desertion prevailed to an alarming extent. The officers, who could not escape their duty in that easy fashion, began to send in their resignations, accompanying them in some instances with insolent expressions against the government for its conduct of the war. This smothered mutiny was not confined to the lower ranks. Even among general officers, there were to be heard the most dangerous outbursts of disrespect and discontent. The most indiscreet and outspoken of all was naturally General Hooker, whose words always readily escaped the fence of his teeth. The commanding general was incompetent. His movements were absurd. The president and government at Washington were imbecile. Nothing would go right till they had a dictator, and the sooner the better. In the midst of an army so ill at ease, commanded by generals so hostile to him, Burnside resolved to make another movement against the enemy. On the day after a gloomy Christmas, he ordered the entire command to prepare three days' rations, and all the staff departments to be ready with ten or twelve days' supplies. He intended to cross the river this time six or seven miles below Fredericksburg. In connection with this movement, he had organized a formidable cavalry expedition through Virginia to break the communications of the enemy and to join General Peck at Suffolk. He communicated his intentions to none but his staff. Just as the expedition was starting, he received a telegram from the President, saying, I have good reason for saying you must not make a general movement of the army without letting me know. The reason for this abrupt interference of the President in Burnside's plan is given in the report of the Committee on the Conduct of the War. On the evening of the 29th of December, Generals John Newton and John Cochran, having leave of absence to go to Washington, sought an interview with the President, and informed him that a forward movement was contemplated by General Burnside, and that the army was in such a state of demoralization and distrust that such a movement would only result in great disaster. Though both these generals, when examined by the committee as to their conduct in the matter, earnestly disclaimed having said anything to Burnside's discredit, it is certain that their representations made a deep and painful impression upon the President. General Burnside at once went to Washington to ask for an explanation of the restraining dispatch, and the President told him frankly what he had heard, without, however, giving the names of his informants. General Burnside returned to his camp without any definite settlement of the interrupted campaign. It is hard to conceive a more difficult position than that which he now occupied. He felt that he ought to go forward, and yet that very movement was paralyzed by the distrust of those about him, and that he was not sufficiently sustained by the confidence of the government. To give an illustration of the way he was beset on every side, on the same day in which he received the President's dispatch, warning him against a forward movement, General Halleck telegraphed him that for the success of the operation of Dix and Foster, it would be necessary for him to occupy and press the enemy. On the same day also, General Meigs, one of the wisest heads in the army, wrote him in advance, saying, Every day weakens your army. Every good day lost is a golden opportunity in the career of our country. Lost forever. Exhaustion steals over the country. Confidence and hope are dying. It seems to me that the army should move bodily up the Rappahannock, cross the river, aim for a point on the railroad between the rebels and Richmond, and send forward cavalry and light troops to break up the road and intercept retreat. A long letter in this strain. The President had a keen and distressing sense of the needs of the situation. 
On the morning of the 1st of January, after a full conversation with General Burnside, feeling how gloomy was the outlook for the coming year, and deeply sympathizing with Burnside's painful embarrassment, he found time, even in the midst of the conventional festivities of New Year's Day, to write this letter to the General-in-Chief. General Burnside wishes to cross the Rappahannock with his army, but his Grand Division commanders all oppose the movement. If in such difficulty as this you do not help, you fail me precisely in the point for which I sought your assistance. You know what General Burnside's plan is, and it is my wish that you go with him to the ground, examine it as far as practicable, confer with those officers, getting their judgment, and ascertaining their temper. In a word, gather all the elements for forming a judgment of your own, and then tell General Burnside that you do approve, or that you do not approve, his plan. Your military skill is useless to me if you will not do this. This letter was handed to General Halleck by Stanton at the usual New Year's reception at the house of the Secretary of War. Halleck interpreted it, as he could hardly avoid doing, as containing a certain tone of criticism of himself, and of his conduct towards generals in the field. He therefore instantly requested to be relieved from his duties as General-in-Chief. While it was true that the President felt there was too much shrinking from legitimate responsibility on the part of General Halleck, he did not wish to relieve him of his office, nor to wound his feelings. He therefore withdrew his letter, writing upon it that he had done so because it was considered harsh by General Halleck, and the General-in-Chief withdrew his request to be relieved. General Burnside, after leaving the President on that unfestive New Year's morning, went back to his lodgings and wrote him a letter in which he said, The Secretary to War has not the confidence of the officers and soldiers, and I feel sure that he has not the confidence of the country. The same opinion applies with equal force in regards to General Halleck. It seems to be the universal opinion that the movements of the Army have not been planned with a view to cooperation and mutual assistance. He then goes on to refer to his first attempt, and its failure, and his conviction that another movement should be made, but that he is not sustained in this by a single Grand Division commander in his army. Doubtless, he says, this difference of opinion between my general officers and myself results from a lack of confidence in me. In this case, it is highly necessary that this army should be commanded by some other officer to whom I will most cheerfully give way. It is my belief that I ought to retire to private life. If the President ever received this letter, he did not retain it. General Burnside said to the Committee of Congress that he expressed these same views verbally to the Secretary of War and the General-in-Chief, but this was contradicted by both these gentlemen. The correspondence of those days is full of misunderstandings, which may easily be accounted for by the perturbation of spirit in which General Burnside passed most of his time. On the 5th of January, General Burnside again wrote, asking the government to authorize another forward movement to which Halleck replied, assenting in general terms, but still declining to give explicit directions. It will not do, he says, to keep your large army inactive. As you yourself admit, it devolves on you to decide upon the time, place, and character of the crossing which you may attempt. The President, on the 8th of January, endorsed this letter of Halleck's in the following words. I approve this letter. I deplore the want of concurrence with you in opinion by your general officers, but I do not see the remedy. Be cautious, and do not understand that the government or country is driving you. I do not yet see how I could profit by changing the command of the Army of the Potomac, and if I did, I should not wish to do it by accepting the resignation of your commission. Upon this, General Burnside again resolved to move on his own responsibility. This resolution resulted in the famous Mud March of the 21st of January. It was begun amid a throng of evil arguries. His immediate subordinates had protested against it with the greatest vehemence. They said flatly that it must fail, that the enemy were too strong, and our own troops not in a fighting mood. General Franklin, Mr. Raymond says, gave one ludicrous reason for not moving, that the New Jersey legislature had just elected a secessionist named Wall to the United States Senate, and the New Jersey troops in his division had therefore concluded that their state was opposed to the war. Hooker also protested. Woodbury of the engineers declared that the movement was impossible. Yet General Burnside went on in a sort of depressed and sullen obstinacy, giving his orders to his recusant commanders for this foredoomed enterprise. 
On the day set for his accomplishment, the elements conspired to fulfill the prophecies of Hooker and Franklin, and to make the march impossible. A cold, drizzling rain set in. The ground speedily became like a sea of glue, absolutely impracticable for wagons or artillery. Everything upon wheels sunk into the bottomless mud. It took twenty horses to start a single caisson. Hundreds of them died in harness, but still the general persisted. He ordered his cavalry to dismount and make pack horses of their animals for carrying forage and light commissary stores to the front. But the rain persisted also, and it soon became a simple impossibility to go forward. The enemy, of course, got intelligence of the movement, and when the Union pickets arrived at the river by Banks Ford, they heard, through the darkness on the other side, the chafing voices of their enemies offering to come over and help them build their bridges. Burnside himself, at last, acknowledged that the expedition had failed, and the army struggled and floundered through the wilderness of mud back to their camp. The march was made in high good humor, the soldiers laughing and joking at their ill luck with that comic brightness characteristic of Americans in difficult circumstances. Nevertheless, it could no longer be denied that General Burnside's usefulness as commander in the army was at an end. He felt that his position had become impossible if the officers in command under him were to remain. On the 23rd of January, he determined to make a final issue between himself and the incorrigible critics in his command. He prepared an order dismissing from the army General Joseph Hooker for unjust and unnecessary criticisms of the actions of his superior officers, as a man unfit to hold an important commission during a crisis like the present, when so much patience, charity, confidence, consideration, and patriotism are due from every soldier in the field. Dismissing General W. T. H. Brooks for complaining of the policy of the government, and for using language tending to demoralize his command, Generals Newton and Cochrane for their furtive visit to the President, and the fourth paragraph of this drastic order relieved from duty Generals Franklin, W. F. Smith, Samuel D. Sturgis, Edward Ferrero, John Cochrane, and Lieutenant Colonel J. H. Taylor. Armed with this order, and with his own letter of resignation, he asked for an audience with the President and on the 24th placed before him the alternative of accepting one or the other. Mr. Lincoln saw there was no longer any time for adjournment or compromise. A commander who had lost the confidence of his soldiers could not regain it by dismissing a few of his generals. The experiment of placing General Burnside at the head of the principal army of the Union had failed. The only question was now as to the choice of his successor. There is no doubt that the public opinion pointed rather to Hooker than to anyone else. He was the most esteemed of all the generals of the Army of the Potomac, at least, and so soon after the ill success of Pope, the President was not inclined to risk the chances of bringing another general from the West. It is believed that he took no advice in regard to the matter. General Halleck says, The removal of General Burnside and appointment of General Hooker was the sole act of the President. Mr. Lincoln was not unaware of General Hooker's attitude towards Birdside and towards himself. His language had been in the highest degree improper and indiscreet. But, as in the case of McClellan, when he thought his services were of value, he employed him, and gave him his full support and confidence, after what would have seemed to most people his unpardonable conduct towards Pope and himself. So, in this crisis, believing that Hooker possessed in a great degree the confidence of the country and the soldiers, and that he had the capacity and energy to lead the army to success, he again took the full responsibility upon himself, and the next day informed General Burnside of his determination. Burnside replied that he was willing to accept that as the best solution of the problem, that no one would be happier than himself if General Hooker could lead that army to victory. He then again tendered his resignation, which the President refused to receive, but gave him leave of absence for thirty days, after which he placed him in command of the Department of the Ohio. Burnside took leave of the army in a manly and chivalrous order commending the brave and skillful general who was to succeed him to that cordial support and cooperation, which, it must be admitted, he had himself hardly received. As Generals Sumner and Franklin were both of higher rank than Hooker, they were relieved from service in the Army of the Potomac, and soon afterwards assigned to other commands, the one in the west, the other on the southern coast. Franklin's undoubtable talents, 
never again had an opportunity for exercise in a field worthy of them. His subsequent career suffered from the severe judgment passed upon him by the Committee on the Conduct of the War, and from the controversies which grew out of it. Sumner never assumed his new command. He died at Syracuse, New York, on the 21st of March, universally respected and beloved by all who were able to appreciate his noble qualities, his valor, and his patriotism. He was the finest type the army possessed of the old-fashioned soldier, the quick eye, the strong arm, the unquestioning spirit of loyal obedience, the simple heart that knew not a pulse of fear or of hesitation, that beat only for his friends, his flag, and his God. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Abraham Lincoln, a History, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, a History, Volume Six by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Eleven Financial Measures the wisdom displayed by mr lincoln in choosing his cabinet not from among his personal adherents but from among the most eminent representatives of the republicans of the country shone out more and more clearly as the war went on and its enormous exigencies tested the utmost powers of each member of the government a great orator and statesman has said that in this respect mr lincoln showed at the outset that nature had fitted him for a ruler and accident only had hid his earlier life in obscurity mr evart says i cannot hesitate to think that the presence of mr seward and mr chase in the great offices of state and treasury and their faithful concurrence in the public service and the public repute of the president's conduct of the government gave to the people all the benefits which might have justly been expected from the election of either to be himself the head of the government and much else besides i know of no warrant in the qualities of human nature to have hoped that either of these great political leaders would have made as good a minister under the administration of the other as president as both of them did under the administration of mr lincoln i see nothing in mr lincoln's great qualities and great authority with this people which could have commensurately served our need in any place in the conduct of affairs except at their head we do not question that posterity will confirm this sober and impartial judgment of one of the most intelligent of contemporary observers lincoln chase and seward were by a long interval the first three republicans of their time and each by what would almost appear a special favor of providence was placed in a position where he could be of most unquestioned service to the country had either of the three except lincoln been president the nation must have lost the inestimable services of the other two we have already dwelt at some length upon the responsibility which devolved during these years upon the secretary of state and upon the unfailing courage sagacity and industry with which he met it before recounting an incident which threatened for a time to deprive the president of the powerful assistance of his two great subordinates it will be necessary to review in a manner however brief and inadequate some of the main points in the administration of the finances during the war the republican party came to power at a time when its adversaries had reduced the credit of the country to a point which now appears difficult to believe even before the election of mr lincoln howell cobb the secretary of the treasury found it difficult to obtain the small sums necessary to meet the ordinary expenses of the government and early in the session of congress which began in december eighteen sixty after the election of mr lincoln amid the gathering gloom of imminent civil war congress authorized the issue of ten millions of treasury notes payable in one year to be issued at the best rate obtainable by the secretary of the treasury that officer having advertised for bids for half the amount authorized only a small sum was offered the rates ranging from ten to thirty-six per cent 
the secretary accepted the offers at twelve obtaining even at that exorbitant rate a meagre sum afterwards a syndicate of bankers upon hard conditions proposed by themselves took the balance of the five millions at twelve per cent a month later when mr cobb had retired and john a dix had assumed the charge of the treasury the slight increase of public confidence derived from the character of the new secretary enabled him to dispose of the other five millions at an average of ten and five eighths per cent in february congress having authorized a further loan of twenty five millions at six per cent mr dix was able to obtain eight millions at a discount of nearly ten per cent it was in this depressed and discouraging state of the public finances that salmon p chase took charge of the treasury without any special previous experience without any other preparation for his exacting task than great natural abilities unswerving integrity and fidelity and unwearying industry he grappled with the difficulties of the situation in a manner which won him the plaudits of the civilized world and will forever enshrine his name in the memory of his fellow-citizens to quote mr evarts again the exactions of the place knew no limits a people wholly unaccustomed to the pressure of taxation and with an absolute horror of a national debt was to be rapidly subjected to the first without stint and to be buried under a mountain of the last taxes which should support military operations on the largest scale and yet not break the back of industry which alone could pay them loans in every form that financial skill could devise and to the farthest verge of the public credit and finally the extreme resort of governments under the last stress and necessity the subversion of the legal tender by the substitution of what has been aptly and accurately called the coined credit of the government for its coined money all these exigencies and all these expedients made up the daily problems of the secretary's life whether the genius of hamilton dealing with great difficulties transcended that of chase meeting the largest exigencies with greater resources is an unprofitable speculation they stand together in the judgment of their countrymen the great financiers of our history immediately upon assuming office mr chase addressed himself to the difficult work before him the only provisions which had been made by law for the support of the government were the fragments of the loan authorized but unsold of his predecessor satisfied that the rates at which money had been borrowed both by cobb and by dix were unnecessarily degrading to the national credit he firmly refused terms similar to those which they had accepted and succeeded in borrowing three million dollars none of it at a lower rate than ninety four and a few days later he borrowed five million dollars more at par even in may after the outbreak of the war he was able to place some nine million dollars of government loans and notes at a rate only a little below their face value these were of course but temporary makeshifts based upon previous legislation but when congress met on the fourth of july in that first special session called by president lincoln an entirely new system of finance had to be instituted the national debt on the first of july was ninety million dollars and there was a balance in the treasury of only two million dollars there was something appalling in the sudden and monstrous increase of the expenses of the government as a consequence of the war the appropriations for the fiscal year eighteen sixty to sixty one were but seventy nine million dollars and the estimates for the year following notwithstanding the threatening outlook were only for seventy five million dollars nobody foresaw the coming exigencies no provision was made to meet them mr chase's estimates for the first physical year of his administration reached the astounding aggregate of three hundred and eighteen million five hundred thousand dollars but before the short session of congress adjourned even this enormous sum was found inadequate 
to meet these immense demands he proposed to raise eighty million dollars by taxes and two hundred and forty million dollars by loans by increasing the taxes upon imports he expected to add twenty seven million dollars to the thirty million dollars already derived from the tariff and three million dollars from miscellaneous sources made up sixty million dollars leaving twenty million dollars to be derived from direct taxes and the excise congress responded with the greatest decision and patriotism to the proposition of the secretary they authorized on the seventeenth of july a loan of two hundred and fifty million dollars and passed laws increasing duties on a great number of articles they apportioned a direct tax of twenty million dollars among the states which was cheerfully paid by the loyal states and an unsuccessful attempt was made to enforce it by commissioners for the states in rebellion the estimates voted for the army were two hundred and seven million dollars for the navy fifty six million dollars and only one million three hundred thousand dollars for civil and miscellaneous purposes every day during the summer and autumn the expenses of the war increased for the last quarter of the year they averaged nearly fifty million dollars a month one of the first measures of relief adopted by the secretary under the authority of congress was the issue of the so-called demand notes payable in coin for the payment of salaries or other debts of the united states and by a later act made receivable for public dues there was at first a great distrust of this form of paper money and the secretary of the treasury and other public officers in order to create confidence joined in an agreement to receive it in payment of their salaries general scott issued a circular to the army announcing the issue of paper money and advising its acceptance several corporations declined to accept the notes in payment of freight there is an instance recorded of a bank in new york refusing to accept a large amount of them except as a special deposit which deposit was afterwards withdrawn the value of the notes having increased with the rise of gold in which they were payable to fifty per cent premium in other paper money but this and other like expedients gave only temporary relief for the permanent and wholesome administration of financial affairs a great national loan was necessary and mr chase held in the city of new york on the nineteenth of august eighteen sixty one a conference with the representatives of the principal bankers of the united states he laid before them with equal eloquence and judgment not only the needs of the government but the safety and value of its securities and after a long and earnest discussion during the course of which it seemed at one time possible that his mission would result in failure he formed a syndicate of banks which advanced the government fifty million dollars and after this loan was successfully placed fifty million dollars more were derived from the same source the government paying seven and three tenths per cent for the money and later he used the authority conferred upon him by the act of july seventeenth eighteen sixty one to issue fifty million dollars more of six per cent bonds at a rate making them equivalent to seven per cents when congress met in december and the secretary in his first annual report gave an account of his stewardship he reported an aggregate of one hundred and ninety seven million dollars realized from loans in all forms the receipts from customs were less than had been expected and on the other hand the expenditures had grown to a sum much larger than in june had been imagined possible the estimates of the summer session were based upon an army of three hundred thousand men double that number were now under arms the pay and the rations of soldiers and sailors had also been augmented and the secretary found himself under the necessity of asking increased appropriations to the amount of two hundred million dollars to meet this needed sum he proposed to increase the tariff and the direct tax to impose duties on liquors and tobacco on notes and deeds and to modify the income tax to the advantage of the government in the presence of the vast obligations devolving upon the administration he did not hesitate to face the facts and with a courage unusual in history 
and a sagacity as surprising as his courage he announced to congress that the public debt which on the first of july eighteen sixty was but sixty four million dollars and on the first of july eighteen sixty one was ninety million dollars would probably amount on the first of july eighteen sixty two to five hundred and seventeen million dollars it was apparent that the volume of currency in the country was not sufficient for the enormous requirements of the public expenditure the banks could neither pay coin to the government for bonds nor dispose of them to their customers for specie the weaker institutions were already tottering and the stronger ones feared a crisis which would result in universal disaster they met in convention on the twenty seventh of december and agreed upon a suspension of specie payments which took place the following day the government necessarily followed the example of the banks and the new year began with the melancholy spectacle of all the public and private institutions of the country redeeming their broken promises with new ones the public debt had risen to three hundred million dollars the treasury was almost empty the daily expenditures amounted to nearly two million dollars it was estimated that three hundred and fifty million dollars were needed to pay the expenses of the government to the close of the fiscal year and the treasury had means for meeting the drafts of the government for less than two months in the world of finance as well as in the world of politics it was generally agreed that the only resort of the government was paper money leading bankers throughout the united states urged this upon the secretary of the treasury as the only practicable expedient the leading statesmen in both houses of congress were brought with extreme reluctance to the same conclusion to no one was this decision more painful than to mr chase he agreed with the greatest of his predecessors in that famous report which has become a classic in our politics and our finances that the emitting of paper money by the authority of government is wisely prohibited to the individual states by the national constitution and the spirit of that prohibition ought not to be disregarded by the government of the united states the wisdom of the government will be shown in never trusting itself with the use of so seducing and dangerous an expedient the stamping of paper is an operation so much easier than the laying of taxes that a government in the practice of paper emissions would rarely fail in any such emergency to indulge itself too far in the employment of that resource to avoid as much as possible one less auspicious to present popularity if it should not even be carried so far as to be rendered an absolute bubble it would at least be likely to be extended to a degree which would occasion an inflated and artificial state of things incompatible with the regular and prosperous course of the political economy but in spite of all this reluctance mr chase felt that an emergency was upon the government from which this was the only issue he saw that the corporate institutions of the country would not receive the notes of the government unless they were made a legal tender by act of congress this state of things he wrote was the high road to ruin and i did not hesitate as to the remedy he threw the entire weight of his influence upon his friends in congress and urged them to prompt and thorough action in a letter to mr stevens the committee of ways and means he said the provision making the united states notes a legal tender has doubtless been well considered by the committee and their conclusion needs no support from any observation of mine i think it my duty to say however that in respect to this provision my reflections have conducted me to the same conclusion they have reached it is not unknown to them that i have felt nor do i wish to conceal that i now feel a great aversion to making anything but coin a legal tender in payment of debts it has been my anxious wish to avoid the necessity of such legislation it is at present impossible however in consequence of the large expenditures entailed by the war and the suspension of the banks to procure sufficient coin for current disbursements it has therefore become indispensably necessary that we should resort to the issue of united states notes 
the making them a legal tender might still be avoided if the willingness manifested by the people generally by railroad companies and by many of the banking institutions to receive and pay them as money in all transactions were absolutely or practically universal but unfortunately there are some persons and some institutions which refuse to receive and pay them and whose action tends not merely to the unnecessary depreciation of the notes but to establish discriminations in business against those who in this matter give a cordial support to the government and in favour of those who do not such discriminations should if possible be prevented and the provision making the notes a legal tender in a great measure at least prevents it by putting all citizens in this respect upon the same level both of rights and duties and several days later on hearing some intimation that the committee thought he was not specially earnest in desiring the passage of the bill he wrote to mr spaulding it is true that i came with reluctance to the conclusion that the legal tender clause is a necessity but i came to it decidedly and i support it earnestly immediate action is of great importance the treasury is nearly empty i have been obliged to draw for the last instalment of the november loan as soon as it is paid i fear the banks generally will refuse to receive united states notes you will see the necessity of urging the bill through without more delay in both houses of congress the measure received the most violent denunciation on the part of those opposed to it and even those who voted in favor of it explained their votes in speeches filled with deprecation of the necessity which demanded it mr sumner after reciting in an eloquent and impassioned speech the evil which he thought would result from such a measure concluded by saying if i mention these things it is because of the unfeigned solicitude i feel with regard to this measure and not with the view of arguing against the exercise of a constitutional power when in the opinion of the government in which i place trust the necessity for its exercise has arrived surely we must all be against paper money we must all insist upon maintaining the integrity of the government and we must all set our faces against any proposition like the present except as a temporary expedient rendered imperative by the exigency of the hour others may doubt if the exigency is sufficiently imperative but the secretary of the treasury whose duty it is to understand the occasion does not doubt in his opinion the war requires this sacrifice whatever may be the national resources they are not now within reach except by summary process reluctantly painfully i consent that the process should issue and yet i cannot give such a vote without warning the government against the dangers from such an experiment the medicine of the constitution must not become its daily bread mr fessenden chairman of the finance committee opened the debate in the senate he said the ground upon which this clause making these notes a legal tender is put i have already stated it is put upon the ground of absolute overwhelming necessity that the government has now arrived at that point where it must have funds and those funds are not to be obtained from ordinary sources or from any of the expedients to which we have heretofore had recourse and therefore this new anomalous and remarkable provision must be resorted to in order to enable the government to pay off the debt that it now owes and afford circulation which will be available for other purposes the question then is does the necessity exist he did not hesitate to say that he would advocate the use of the strong arm of the government to any extent in order to accomplish the purpose in which we are engaged he would take the money of any citizen against his will to sustain the government if nothing else was left and bid him wait until the government could pay him it is a contribution which every man is bound to make under the circumstances we can take all the property of any citizen that is what is called a forced contribution the question after all returns is this measure absolutely indispensable to procure means if so as i said before necessity knows no law 
say what you will nobody can deny that it is bad faith if it be necessary for the salvation of the government all considerations of this kind must yield but to make the best of it it is bad faith and encourages bad morality both in public and private going to the extent that it does to say that notes thus issued shall be receivable in payment of all private obligations however contracted is in its very essence a wrong for it compels one man to take from his neighbour in payment of a debt that which he would not otherwise receive or be obliged to receive and what is probably not full payment mr collamer argued strongly against the legal tender clause of the bill he considered it neither necessary nor constitutional he referred to the debates in the convention that formed the constitution to show that coin was the only legal tender contemplated by the founders of the government there was an express power to borrow money on the credit of the united states when there is an express power there can be no implied power to do the same thing there were two modes of replenishing the treasury one by taxation the other by borrowing to borrow there must be a lender and a borrower and both should act voluntarily and not compel the lender to part with his money without an inducement the operation of this bill was not so honourable or honest as a forced loan mr spaulding mr conkling mr morrill and mr pendleton of the house mr bayard and others of the senate spoke in the same strain of sorrowful apprehension but the bill became a law on the twenty fifth of february eighteen sixty two this important law which mr chase as secretary of the treasury urged upon congress and which mr chase as chief justice of the united states afterwards decided to be unconstitutional authorized the issue of one hundred and fifty million dollars of united states notes not bearing interest payable at the treasury of the united states in denominations of not less than five dollars these notes were to be received in payment of all debts and demands of every kind due to the united states except duties on imports which were payable in coin and they were to be paid by the united states in satisfaction of all claims against the government except for interest upon the public debt which also was to be paid in coin the receipts from customs being devoted to this purpose and these notes were to be lawful money and legal tender in payment of all debts public and private within the united states with the exceptions above mentioned and they were to be received at par in exchange for government bonds by a later act the demand notes were also made a legal tender and some of the banks had refused to receive them without such provision it was thought in february that one hundred and fifty million dollars of this currency would be enough but in june it was evident that this would not be the case one hundred and fifty million dollars more were demanded by the secretary and at once authorized by congress thirty five million dollars of this last issue were to be in denominations of less than five dollars even this vast volume of currency did not supply the insatiable demands of the time and the rapidly increasing popularity of the united states notes or greenbacks as they were called induced the government to ask and congress to grant a wide extension of the authority to issue them so that before the war ended one billion two hundred and fifty million dollars of legal tender had been authorized by congress of this four hundred and fifty million dollars were in legal tender united states notes four hundred million dollars in treasury notes payable not more than three years from date and bearing interest not exceeding six per cent four hundred million dollars in treasury notes redeemable after three years bearing a currency interest not exceeding seven and three tenths per cent this full authority was not availed of by the secretary of the treasury the legal tenders outstanding on the thirtieth of june eighteen sixty four amounted to six hundred million dollars and a year later under the administration of mr fessenden they amounted to six hundred and sixty nine million dollars the public debt at the close of the fiscal year eighteen sixty four was one billion seven hundred and forty million dollars and the next year 
two billion six hundred eighty two million dollars which was increased some two hundred million dollars by the necessary expenses that followed as a sequel of the war this is not the place to reopen the controversy which outlasted the war and for years afterwards was an element of disorganization in politics and of a bitter and somewhat demoralizing dispute in both houses of the congress of the united states it will probably be the verdict of posterity as it was the opinion of the ablest statesmen of the time that the legal tender act was a necessary exercise of the powers of the government in a time of supreme emergency that the result of that act was all that its advocates hoped for in sustaining the government in a period of vast and compulsory expenditure and that the evils which grew out of it great as they unquestionably were were not so disastrous as the fears of intelligent economists at the time apprehended gold having been driven from circulation by the legal tender notes became at once the favourite commodity for speculation in wall street and while the premium upon it rose to a certain extent in proportion to the increase of the volume of paper money and was subject to violent fluctuations in consequence of military successes or disasters there was no such method in the course of its quotations as to render them explicable by either of these influences it had become so to speak a fancy stock and there was no more reason for its wilder fluctuations than for those of other securities which rise and fall in obedience to the currents of wall street and without reference to intrinsic values just before the passage of the legal tender bill the premium upon gold was four and three eighths per cent and shortly after it became a law the premium fell to one and a half but it gradually rose until in the middle of july it was seventeen in the middle of october thirty two and a half and at the end of the year thirty four on the twenty fifth of february eighteen sixty three after the legal tender law had been in operation for a year the premium on gold had risen to seventy two and a half the brilliant successes of the national cause at gettysburg and vicksburg reduced it to twenty three and a half it rose again in october to fifty six and three eighths and rose no higher than that until the following spring when on the fourteenth of april eighteen sixty four it was quoted at eighty eight and on the twenty second of june as the consequence of an ill-advised bill passed by congress to prevent speculation in gold the premium climbed at once to the frightful altitude of a hundred and thirty following the day afterwards to one hundred and fifteen on the first of july it jumped to one hundred and eighty five on the second it fell back to one hundred and thirty and on the sixth the unfortunate law born of a short-sighted patriotism was repealed the mischief however was not yet over for five days later there was a rise to one hundred and eighty five above par the highest figure attained during the war followed by a sharp fall which continued until gold was quoted on the twenty sixth of september at eighty seven thus falling nearly one hundred points in less than three months there was no warrant in the financial or the military condition of the country for these wild fluctuations they were the offspring of the desperate efforts of cupidity and enterprise which found their predestined prey in the fears and apprehensions of more timid speculators the secretary of the treasury was authorized in march eighteen sixty four to sell surplus gold for the purpose of checking this speculation and in april the premium having risen to seventy five mr chase went in person to new york to try the effect of the sale of cash gold upon the trade in phantom gold the day he arrived the speculators defied him by running the premium to eighty eight he sold about eleven million dollars reducing the premium to sixty five with convulsive fluctuations but when the pressure of the treasury was removed the price of gold mounted as before the same experiment was frequently tried afterwards with more or less success the troubles of the time which had reduced the treasury of the united states to a condition of impoverishment had exercised as was natural exactly the contrary effect upon the banks of new york the timidity of capital 
had accumulated a great surplus of money in these institutions with a far smaller number of loans and discounts than usual the deposits amounted at the end of eighteen sixty one to one hundred and forty six million dollars at the suggestion of john j cisco the assistant treasurer in new york the secretary of the treasury adopted a system of temporary loans which was sanctioned by congress in a clause of the legal tender law and the authority thus given was increased by successive acts until the limit was fixed at one hundred and fifty million dollars these loans were not only of great advantage to the government as well as to the lenders but they also served as a useful balance to the money market in times of severe pressure the reimbursement of large sums was often the means of temporary relief another expedient authorized by congress on the first of march eighteen sixty two was the issuing of certificates of indebtedness to such creditors of the united states as chose to receive them in payment of audited accounts they were payable one year from date with interest at six per cent the power to issue them was unlimited and their extensive issue led at last to their serious depreciation another important clause of the legal tender act in addition to those we have mentioned was that which authorized the secretary of the treasury to issue coupon or registered bonds to an amount not exceeding five hundred million dollars redeemable at the pleasure of the united states after five years and payable twenty years from date and bearing interest at the rate of six per cent per annum payable semi-annually they were to be exempt from taxation by state authority and the coin from duties on imports was to be set aside as a special fund for the payment of interest on the bonds and notes of the united states and for other specified purposes these were the famous five twenty bonds which issued at first at a slight discount below par and paper justified the faith and the sagacity of their earliest purchasers by a steady rise during all the years of their existence and were all paid in gold or converted into other securities long before the time fixed for their redemption all these measures the secretary said in his annual report of december eighteen sixty two worked well if congress had passed at the previous session the national banking law which he urged upon it he thought that no financial necessity would at that time have demanded additional legislation but the bill which had been introduced for that purpose a year before had found few supporters its only advocate of prominence in the house of representatives was samuel hooper of massachusetts a gentleman whose sound judgment and large knowledge of financial subjects gave great and deserved weight to his opinions he could do nothing more at the moment than to obtain leave to bring in a bill for that purpose but in the course of the year that followed the absolute necessity for some such measure became every day more apparent the coin in the country variously estimated at from one hundred and fifty million dollars to two hundred and ten million dollars was absolutely inadequate to the demands of the time the system of state banks in existence at the beginning of the war was not only incommensurate to the needs of the country but radically vicious in itself there was no uniformity of credit no guarantee whatever of authenticity in circulation out of one thousand five hundred banks there were said to be fewer than three hundred whose notes were not counterfeited there was but a comparatively small number whose notes were not subject to discount outside of the state in which they were issued and a citizen travelling from the mississippi to the hudson found the contents of his wallet changing in value whenever he crossed a state line of course with the immense demand for currency created by the war all these evils were greatly increased and aggravated and when congress met again in december eighteen sixty two the secretary urged anew with the added weight of authority which came from a more fully matured plan and an enlarged experience the scheme which had been treated with neglect the year before for establishing a safe and uniform currency throughout the nation the national bank act was prepared in accordance with the views of mr chase by e g spaulding of new york and samuel hooper of massachusetts who were members of the committee of ways and means and during the month of december eighteen sixty one it was printed for the use of that committee 
the bill encountered most earnest opposition in the committee which was busily engaged on the loan and internal revenue bills and other important work and it was finally laid aside in his report for eighteen sixty two mr chase again notwithstanding the suspension of specie payments earnestly advocated the measure he said that among the advantages which would arise from its passage would be that the united states bonds would be required for banking purposes a steady market would be established and their negotiation greatly facilitated it is not easy to appreciate the full benefits of such conditions to a government obliged to borrow it would reconcile as far as practicable the interests of existing institutions with those of the whole people and would supply a firm anchorage to the union of the states the same bill which had been printed for the use of the committee of ways and means was afterwards introduced by mr sherman and referred to the finance committee of the senate from which it was reported by him on february two eighteen sixty three with amendments ten days later it passed that body by a vote of twenty three to twenty one and on the twentieth of the same month it also passed the house of representatives by a vote of seventy eight to sixty four the bill is understood to have had the sanction of every member of the administration and president lincoln earnestly advocated its passage in his annual message in eighteen sixty two and in eighteen sixty three he said the enactment by congress of a national banking law has proved a valuable support of the public credit and the general legislation in relation to loans has fully answered the expectations of its favorers some amendments may be required to perfect existing laws but no change in their principles or general scope is believed to be needed again in eighteen sixty four he thus referred to it the national banking system is proving to be acceptable to capitalists and to the people changes from state systems to the national system are rapidly taking place and it is hoped that very soon there will be in the united states no banks of issue not authorized by congress and no bank note circulation not secured by the government that the government and the people will derive great benefit from this change in the banking system of the country can hardly be questioned the national system will create a reliable and permanent influence in support of the national credit and protect the people against losses in the use of paper money whether or not any further legislation is advisable for the suppression of state bank issues it will be for congress to determine it seems quite clear that the treasury cannot be satisfactorily conducted unless the government can exercise a restraining power over the bank note circulation of the country the bill was warmly advocated by those who appreciated its advantages and as earnestly opposed by those who thought they foresaw the growth of a powerful monetary system dangerous to the popular liberties its chief opponent in the senate was collamer who ably represented the traditions of the past it was most efficiently advocated by john sherman of ohio to whom was reserved a part of great honor and usefulness in bringing to a close the financial history of the war the principal features of this comprehensive scheme were to open the, to private capital the business of national banking so freely that there could be no reasonable accusation of privilege or monopoly to give to the whole system of banks a homogeneous circulation of notes having a common impression authenticated by a common authority made safe by an adequate provision of specie and secured for redemption by the pledge of united states bonds deposited in washington and finally by the act of march three eighteen sixty five to tax out of existence the circulation of the banks organized under state laws the whole system being thus based upon government bonds several hundreds of millions of united states notes were funded in bonds it was the secretary's belief afterwards fully justified under the wise and masterly administration of mr sherman that this system of national banks would be of invaluable assistance in the resumption of specie payment by the government he said if temporarily these associations redeem their issues with united states notes resumption of specie payment will not thereby be delayed or endangered but hastened and secured 
for just as soon as victory shall restore peace the ample revenue already secured by wise legislation will enable the government through advantageous purchases of specie to replace at once large amounts and at no distant day the whole of this circulation by coin without detriment to any interest but on the contrary with great and manifest benefit to all interests the bill was constantly amended and improved and although it might be too much to say that it was ever rendered entirely perfect it is perhaps not unquestioned that few more wise and beneficent measures have ever been devised by american statesmanship no financial operation so prodigious as those which we have thus briefly sketched had ever before been known the largest loans ever made by england were those which she negotiated in the terrible years of eighteen twelve to thirteen when she was fighting at the same time napoleon and the united states the british government borrowed in those years five hundred and thirty four million dollars only a little more than mr chase borrowed in nine months the estimated wealth of the united kingdom at that time and of the loyal states in eighteen sixty was almost the same in each case something over ten thousand millions of dollars nowhere we believe do the annals of the world record such an appreciation of the public credit as that which is seen from the time of mr lincoln's accession to the presidency until the period of the resumption of specie payment after the close of the war it was hard for mr buchanan's secretaries of the treasury to borrow money to pay the ordinary expenses of the government at twelve per cent mr chase as soon as congress had given him command of the machinery required in the legal tender currency the popular loan and the national banking law found no great difficulty in supplying at six per cent the ravenous wants of a most costly war and under the operation of the laws provided for him and similar legislation called for by his successors the government credit gradually rose until its four per cents sold at one hundred and thirty and its three per cents commanded a premium at the beginning the secretary was forced to rely more upon individual patriotism than upon public confidence but long before the war ended he had hundreds of millions at his command in all these important labors mr chase had the constant support of the president mr lincoln exercised less control and a less constant supervision over the work of the treasury than over some other departments but he rated at their true value the industry and the ability of the secretary and the immense responsibility devolved upon his department and contributed to its success in every way in his power he sometimes made suggestions of financial measures but did not insist on their being adopted and when the secretary needed his powerful assistance with congress he always gave it ungrudgingly in regular and special messages he urged upon congress the measures which the secretary thought important and in frequent and informal conferences at the executive mansion with the leading members of both houses he exerted all his powers of influence and persuasion to assist the secretary in obtaining what legislation was needed the monetary disorganization which preceded and accompanied the wreck of the confederacy was so complete and so universal that southern writers have taken no pains to preserve any accurate account of their financial system if system it may be called where system there was none their debt ceased to exist their money lost all value at the instant the struggle became hopeless for by the very terms of their certificates of indebtedness they had no worth until after the ratification of a treaty of peace between the united states and the confederate states it is estimated that when the war ended the nominal debt of the confederate states was about thirty five hundred million dollars but these portentous figures had no meaning some confederate writers think the actual cost of the war on the southern side was in the neighborhood of one thousand millions but this from the nature of the case can never be ascertained with exactness their financial management was inefficient and chaotic from the beginning early in the winter of the first year of the war the bank suspended specie payments from the insufficient data obtainable it is estimated that there were about fifty millions of specie in the south at that time divided between the banks and the hordes of individuals this gradually disappeared some was employed in the foreign trade some seized by the government 
very little came to the surface when the war had ended the paper money had extirpated it in fact the successive issues of paper money were the only events worth mentioning in the financial history of the confederacy the efforts made in other directions to give some solidity to their finances were feeble and nugatory they issued a loan of fifteen millions bearing eight per cent interest this interest was payable in specie which was secured by the pledge of an export duty of one-eighth of one per cent per pound on the cotton sent out of the country this loan was placed at satisfactory rates the interest was paid for a little while as promised in specie but the poverty of the insurrectionary government finally forced even this sacred debt to go to default the cotton loans negotiated in europe had a certain success but the money resulting from them was mostly spent beyond the atlantic and afforded little relief to the straitened treasury at richmond heavy loans were made with the banks in the southern states when they matured they were paid in treasury notes the banks under the stimulus of the war and of the demands of the richmond government rapidly multiplied their circulation specie payments being suspended there was no check upon expansion unsafe as the currency of the banks was it was still regarded as more secure than the flood of paper money sent out by the confederate financiers at richmond and gradually disappeared from circulation being hoarded by the provident as a nest egg for quieter times but in the course of the war the banks were ruined by the annihilation of the paper values which formed their principal assets and their carefully hoarded bills when brought to light were almost as worthless as the vanished confederate currency there was properly speaking no financial management of the insurrection issues of bonds were authorized by the congress and made by the successive secretaries of the treasury but they bore no proportion to the ever-increasing expenses of the war and the deficit had to be met by printing more money which at last grew less valuable than the paper on which it was printed there was in the end no definite relation between the price of gold and the value of the confederate currency in the north there was great fluctuation of such relative values but they were generally the same at a given moment throughout the country in the days of the wildest gambling in wall street the quotations made there governed the price of gold in boston philadelphia and chicago but in the south it could hardly be said that quotations existed at richmond the seat of the confederate government the gold dollar was frequently worth fifty or more paper dollars while in the interior the business of the country was being transacted on a basis of five for one and even in the final throes of the insurrection the currency never became so worthless in the rural districts as it was in the very shadow of the capital of virginia as the confederate securities were intrinsically valueless except in the event of final success their holders were sure sooner or later to lose their principal but the confederate loan was handled with such singular incapacity that its promoters did not derive from it even such advantage as was practicable it is true that james m mason the confederate commissioner in london did succeed in september eighteen sixty two in placing cotton bonds to the value of some sixty thousand pounds through the house of w s lindsay m p an ardent southern sympathizer this was speedily absorbed by the needs of the rebel navy and lindsay proposed a far more extensive scheme of finance based on the delivery at southern ports of cotton belonging to the confederate government at the price of four pence a pound this would have afforded a large profit to those who actually got their cotton and sold it in england but before this plan was carried into effect baron erlinger and mr slidell had arranged a scheme for placing a confederate loan in england and the cotton scheme of mason and lindsay was withheld so as not to embarrass the more brilliant operation the loan was put on the market on the eighteenth of march eighteen sixty three with all the appearance of a dazzling success five millions sterling were subscribed the first day the applications coming from every part of europe and before the books closed sixteen millions had been nominally subscribed and the certificates commanded a premium of five per cent which however immediately dropped to one or two mr mason wrote to richmond in a tone of exultation over the triumphant success of our infant credit it shows malgre all detraction and calumny that cotton is king at last the triumph was short-lived a few days later the loan began to drop in the market and the erlingers came in a panic to mr mason telling him that unless the price was somehow kept up the loan would be wrecked 
he therefore authorized them to buy in behalf of the confederate government a million pounds worth of the securities and as this did not prove effectual in sustaining prices he afterwards increased his order a half million more this desperate expedient checked the disaster for a little while the confederates hoped to sell out their holdings at a profit but the rise never came in his final report of the transaction mr mason shows one million three hundred eighty eight thousand five hundred pounds on the wrong side of his ledger and only twenty six thousand pounds on the right after gettysburg and vicksburg the loan dropped thirty per cent and the confederate credit was evidently wounded to death mr slidell afterwards gently reproached his government for not having let him know beforehand that vicksburg was to fall as in that case they could have disposed of the balance of their loan all this while mr mason and his dispatches deplored the blindness of the germans who were eagerly investing their savings in united states bonds at less than fifty cents on the dollar he even went to frankfort to warn them against this mistaken policy taking an interpreter with him as he was not himself polyglot he did not succeed in convincing them and came back to france at least so much wiser for his journey that he declined a proposition of baron erlinger to destroy the credit of the united states abroad by issuing an official and authoritative statement that the confederate states would not hold themselves liable for a dollar of the united states loan End of chapter 11